Well, good morning, everybody. Let's stand. We're going to teach a new song this morning. The Lord our God is the name of the song. And there's a phrase in it about God's plans. And that's what we're going to focus on today is God's plans for our lives. and the way things happen is not how we want it to happen. Still, we know that God is still God. God is still in control. And that we give thanks to him each and every day. So let's sing. Give thanks to the Lord, our Lord, our God. He is love endures forever. <laughs> I was going to say, he's going to be playing by himself. That sounds better. the Lord our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing 
Should have had everybody greet each other while we're waiting, but hey, too late. <laughs> Nancy. I'm sorry.
God, we indeed are thankful that you are an everlasting God, a holy God, a faithful God. And Father, that you promise never to leave, never to forsake. And Father, today as we just consider the path we're on, the life we live, the journey we are walking, help us to know that uh, you are always there. And so, Father, as those who are going through difficulties in this day, help them to know that you are there. Father, we thank you uh, that we can just cry out on behalf of family and friends, loved ones, uh, those who are grieving. Uh, we pray for, we lift Brian and Crystal before you today. We just pray for Kevin and Kendra today. Father, just so many others that are surrounding us. Thank you for our college students who are home this weekend. Father, it is just good to be a church family and to know that uh, we don't have to go through life alone and we're not walking the journey alone. So Father, when we face the difficulties, help us to lean on you. Help us to lean into one another as well and to know that together you give us hope. Together you give us answers to our prayers. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. As we prepare for the communion time, sing a song that's familiar, a gentleman who lost his entire family, and then he pens these words, which is amazing. As we think about the difficulties we go through, know that our God is still there, and he gives us that peace. And as we gather for communion, let's think of that as well.
walk very far. I'm lazy. Um, so last week, a bunch of us peoples went to a baseball game, and we had the best seats in the house because we had shade the whole time, and it rained on us just, just a little bit, but mostly on the people in front of me because I was under shelter. Uh, and it made me think about this idea of coming together for something. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm a very passionate soccer fan. Um, I like to go into the places where you see on TV where they're jumping and screaming and throwing and there might be smoke bombs going off and other things happening. That's my jam when it comes to cheering at sports. So like when I go to like a football game or a baseball game and the cheering is, yay. And that thing happens for like five minutes and they're like, yay. Like I'm the guy that likes to go for an hour and a half straight jumping, screaming, and then losing my voice. Uh, my wife, when I go to games and I do that, will not go with me because I embarrass her. Uh, <laughs> I'm that guy. But it's really interesting how groups of people can come together under one banner. You have your favorite sports team. 91,000 people got really disappointed last night in Nebraska. And I think that's hilarious. <laughs> Many other people across this nation had their sports teams lose yesterday under their banner. Many of them had them win. Uh, but it's interesting that on Sunday morning, we all across this great nation and across the world gather together under one banner. And that's not our own banner, but Christ. And in Matthew, Jesus tells his disciples, 18, if, chapter 18, if you want to know, uh, he says, when two or more of you are together, I'm there. Uh, and I think sometimes we take advantage of that and don't really realize that like when we get together with our brothers and sisters in Christ we are the church not only are we the church but we are the representatives of Christ's bride and as we come around this table sometimes people want to make it this huge like I like to call it an emo thing and if you don't know what emo is just imagine candlelit bathtub around someone reading a book and dark hair and just crying all the time that's emo when I give it to you. And there are times that we need to be like that. We need to be sorrowful because of where we are with Christ. But there are times that we need to be celebratory that Christ won. And I don't think we do that enough. I know I don't. Um, and this week I just kept thinking about victory and, and how Christ has a victory that we can't even proclaim. But we can say that he had the victory. And as we go into this communion, I just ask that we prepare our hearts and celebrate a little bit of God's victory so that we can have the freedom that we have and we don't have to slaughter goats. Pray with me real quick. Dear God, I thank you so much for the ability to come together, to worship you, to use our talents and times and treasures to give to you. I thank you for the ability to have the freedom that we openly can convene and talk and fellowship and glorify you. I pray that this doesn't end here today but goes throughout the rest of our week. Please help us to glorify you and to chant and scream and holler with our actions about your glory and victory. In your name I pray. Amen.
Dear Heavenly Father, we're just truly grateful for today to uh, come and worship you in this house, our freedom. To, you've done so much for us. Uh, we pray that uh, we can re return a portion of what you've blessed us with. Bless the gift and the giver that will further your kingdom. In thy name we pray. Amen. <laughs> So my wife just wrecked me. <laughs> it, it, it does. It does. So she's passing around the picture of Wyatt, our new grandson, who was born, just born. And so we're, <laughs> we're super excited. Super, super excited. Hey, in your bulletin, you'll notice things about pizza, pictures, and, and uh, prayer. Okay? Well, pizza is the recipes. If you haven't turned in recipes, I know Cheryl would love to see, uh, get those from you. Uh, prayer, I think there might be some still some cards out here of kids we are praying for throughout this school year. And, uh, and then pictures. This Thursday, Friday, Saturday is our picture days. And with that being in mind, we want to clear out the back two-thirds of this room. So if, if you, uh, from those poles back, all of the chairs need to be stacked after the worship service today. So uh, check out the other things going on. Thank you for your prayers for kickoff for our youth groups. We had a great start to the year. Uh, and so those, are, those will continue on on Wednesday. Um, as we dismiss our kids for, for mustard seeds, watch this last video of, that's just kind of a teaser of what today's message is all about. Stories abound of people who have been on a journey and they are walking down that journey and all of a sudden an unexpected happens. The unexpected comes in the form of an accident that leaves you crippled. The unexpected comes in the form of a medical bill that causes a uh, cancellation of a vacation that you look forward to for so long. The unexpected comes in the form of losing a scholarship that you no longer have because your grades weren't high enough. And so now you realize, oh wait, I can't finish this year of school. The unexpected comes in the form of the call to the boss's office and the boss says, I'm letting you go. The unexpected comes in the form of a miscarriage. The unexpected comes in the form of, of uh, just a simple little thing is a simple day off that you get called into work. You were looking for that day off, but you were called into work because somebody else just didn't show up or 
you're covering because someone else is experiencing their unexpected. Life is filled with so many times barriers that come in our, way, in our path. And over the past few weeks, we have been looking at the story or the thought of the path. That direction determines destination. And as we looked at last week, the principle of the focus, what gets our attention, attention determines direction, which determines destination. We all have goals. We all have dreams. We all have hopes of being somewhere or being able to do something. And we find these Barriers that come into our path. Barriers that keep us from being able to reach the destination that we had hoped. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about, though, the reality that sometimes the, where, the destination that we hope for meets an impassable barrier. And what we find is we find this. that the road is closed. And I'm not gonna get to where I wanna go. What do we do when we meet an unreachable destination? Let me pray. Father God, I just ask that you will just guide this day as we think about the path you want us to walk, and the path that we even dream of, but sometimes, Lord, the reality is the path that we dream of, the path that we hope for, is an unreachable destination. So, Father, would you speak to us today as to how we make it through when the destination is not going to be reached? Thank you, Lord, for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Di direction determines destination. But what happens when I come to a destination that I can't reach? We've been looking at the Old Testament book of Proverbs, and in the book of Proverbs we've seen lots of great little truths. The proverb we're going to look at today does not include the word path. This is not going to turn on. But here's the proverb we're going to look at. Hope delayed makes the heart sick, but desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Hope delayed makes the heart sick. Sometimes I have a path that I'm hoping to get to, but then I come to this barrier. I can't get there. Hope delayed. Some translations say hope deferred. Some translations will say other things. This contemporary English says, when I don't get what I want... It makes my heart sick. When I don't get what I want, it makes my heart sick. I found a newer translation called the, the, the uh, Passion Translation. It says, when hope's dreams seem to drag on and on, the delay is depressing. The word delay, or um, other translations, how it is, the word... The, it means this idea of it's, it's something that is just drags on and on and on. I want to be there. I want to be at this destination, but I just can't get there. And the pain just drags on and on and on. Well, one of the things I hope that we can see today is that when hope is delayed, there is a reality. It makes our heart sick. It is disappointing to face one of these barriers. It's disappointing to lose a job. It's disappointing to lose a child. It's disappointing to be, not be able to do what we had hoped we had wanted to do. That's disappointing. And that's a reality. And that's okay. The question I want to ask, want you to ask today is when you are heart sick, what are you going to become? Because the reality is when hope is delayed, it makes the heart sick. But the, we have a choice. Will we become bitter or will we become better? That's the choice. When we are walking down the path and we hit this road closed or we hit a simple little barrier, what are we going to do? Are we going to become bitter or are we going to become better? I think Paul has an illustration in his life. 
And he writes in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, a challenge to all of us as to how we can become better when we face a roadblock along the way. If you have your Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, because I love the Apostle Paul. I think he is amazing. He author of 12 or 13, 12 books of the New Testament. He's, uh, he writes so many encouraging words, so many challenging words. But you know what's, in, what's interesting to me is Paul's life was not always easy. Paul faced obstacles. Paul faced challenges. Paul faced road closed. He had desires to go somewhere and it was revealed to him he couldn't go. So Paul knew what it was like to face this barrier. Paul knew what it was like to come up to a hope delayed or a hope deferred or a prolonged going on and on and on and wondering will it even be a reality? Hope deferred, hope delayed makes the heart sick. And when my heart is sick, do I become bitter or do I become better? Paul gives us some clues of how we can be better when our heart is sick. He writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting with verse 7, right in the middle of that verse. Therefore, so that I would not exalt myself, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan, to torment me so that I would not exalt myself. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Father three times that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more about my weakness, so that Christ's power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and in difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul gives to us some actions of when we face the barriers in life, when we reach the road closed. What is it that we can do to make it better rather than being bitter? I think the first thing we need to do is we need to pray. I know that sounds like a Sunday school answer. You just need to pray about it. That sounds too simple. It sounds too easy. And sometimes when we are facing the barriers in life, the road closed, the road closed path, it is maybe God is the last person that we want to cry out to. But we need to pray. Notice what Paul says. He says, I pleaded with God three times that it would leave me. Paul didn't just take it to God once and then let it go. He kept pleading to God that it would be taken from him. He prayed. And I think there's a lesson for us, a challenge for us. We don't know what Paul's thorn in the flesh is and what's, there's a lot of speculation. What's important is not what it was, but it is what Paul does with his thorn in the flesh. He prays. He pleaded with God. God wants to hear our heartfelt emotion. God wants to hear that, that hurt that we have. God wants to know it. And he already knows it, but sometimes we need to let it known in our own lives that God wants us to cry out to him that God, my heart is sick because I can't do that. Or because this path, this hope, this dream will be unrealized. He pleaded with the Lord. He prayed. Consider Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. When Jesus faced an obstacle, a barrier, he knew what was going to happen. And Jesus himself, when he faced that barrier, when he faced that moment in his life, he pleaded. Luke chapter 22 and starting with verse 39, it says, He went up and made his way as usual to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when he reached the place, he told them, Pray that you may not fall into temptation. Then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down, and began to pray. Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. 
Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, strengthening him. Being in anguish, he prayed more fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. And when he got up from the prayer, he came to his disciples and found them sleeping, exhausted from their grief. Jesus models what Paul modeled. When we are facing an obstacle, when we are facing an unreachable destination, pray. Pray. Even though God may not be who you want to talk to at the moment, talk to him. Pray. The second thing we can do as we see from Paul's life is what does he do? When he prays, he hears from God. So as we are praying, listen for God's voice. God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in your weakness. God spoke to him. And sometimes it is when we are just, we humble ourselves and we cry out to our God. We plead with him. We plead to him. They're just, Lord, give me understanding. Maybe that's our greatest prayer. Is to become to the point where I realize this is an unreachable goal. This is not going to happen. Lord, help me to understand what I should do. Because I have met the road closed. Because I have come to the end of the path that I hoped would be indifferently. But because I am here, help me to understand. And maybe we need to hear like Paul did. That my grace is sufficient. My love is sufficient. I am sufficient. For my power is made complete in your weakness. And no matter what, what obstacle we face, our God is still there. And so listen to his voice. Listen for his voice. A third thing that Paul does is he accepts the reality and he finds the good. I pleaded with the Lord three times that he would take away this thorn in the flesh, but God said, my grace is sufficient for you. Notice then what Paul does. He says this, therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weakness so that Christ's power may reside in me. And I take pleasure in weakness, in insults, in hardships, persecutions, and in difficulties. I take pleasure in weakness. I take pleasure in difficulties. That's a hard point to come to. But when Paul prayed and God, he listened for God's voice, God spoke to him and he gave him a heart. He says, look at the good. My power is made perfect. My power is made complete in your weakness. For when you are weak, then I am the strongest. And so Paul saw the good in the situation. Paul would write to the Romans that God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God has something good in, our, in, in store for us. Even though it's not maybe the path we thought we would be on, maybe it's not the destination that we hoped we would arrive at, but God has something good that can come out of that situation. A young lady who is the mom of a special needs child wrote this poem or this little short story called Welcome to Holland. I'm often asked to describe the experience of raising a child with a dis disability. To try to help people who have not shared that unique experience to understand it and to imagine how it would feel. I, it's like this. When you're going to have a baby, it's like planning this fabulous vacation to Italy. You buy a bunch of guidebooks, you make wonderful plans, the Colosseum, Michelangelo's David, the gondolas in Venice. You may learn handy phrases in Italian. It's all very, very exciting. And after months of eager anticipation, the day finally arrives. You pack your bags and off you go. Several hours later, the, plan la the plane lands and the stewardess comes in and says, welcome to Holland. Holland, you say. What do you mean Holland? I signed up for Italy. I'm supposed to be in Italy. All my life I've dreamed of going to Italy. But there's been a change in the flight plan. And they landed in Holland. And there you must stay. 
The important thing is that you haven't taken you to some horrible, disgusting, filthy place full of pestilence, famine, and disease. It's just a different place. So you must go out and buy a new guidebook, and you must learn a whole new language, and you will meet a whole new group of people you would have never have met before. It's just a different place. It's slower than I Italy, less flashy than Italy, but after you've been there a while and you catch your breath, you look around and you begin to notice that Holland has windmills. Holland has tulips. Holland even has Rembrandts. But everyone you know is busy coming and going from Italy. And they're all bragging about it. What a wonderful time they had there. But for the rest of your life, you will say, yes, that's where I was supposed to go. That's what I had planned. The plan is that the, the pain of that will never, ever go away. But the loss of that dream is a very significant loss. But if you spend your whole life mourning the fact that you didn't get to go to Italy, you may never be free to enjoy the very special, very lovely things about Holland. Life sometimes has roadblocks. Life sometimes has obstacles. Life is filled with unreachable destinations. And when we are faced with that roadblock, that unreachable destination, look for the good. Welcome to Holland. Welcome to Holland. The fourth thing that we can do is not only we can pray, we can listen for God's voice, we can look for the good, but the last thing we can do is use it for God's glory. Paul writes in, in, his last, in the last phrases of, of this, he says, so that Christ's power may reside in me. He wanted that God to be glorified. He wanted God to be in control. He wanted God to use his weakness. He wanted God to use his barrier. He wanted God to use his roadblock that God may receive the glory. The reality is sometimes the path that we hoped we would, the destination that we would hope to have been on is not going to happen. The question is, when our heart is sick, when the plan is deferred, the plant, the road is blocked. Do we become bitter? Or will we become better? Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for the hope that you do give to us. The Father, in our times of prayer, we can cry out to you when we face the road closed. Father, help us to hear your voice when the road is closed. Help us to see that maybe this, because the destination isn't the one that we thought we were going to arrive at, that, Father, you are still there. And you have something good for us to experience in the new path. And, Father, may our lives always be ones that glorify you. Father, help us as we walk the path, the path of life, knowing that you are there, that you're walking with us, even when we get distracted from the path or even when the path is blocked. Father, help us to lean into you. Help us to give up our plans for the sake of your plan. Help us to walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sometimes the hardest thing for us to do is when we face the road closed, is for us to ha realize, I had plans. But his plan, our plans are not his plans sometimes. And even though my path meets an obstacle, my hope is deferred, my hope is destroyed, that God is still there. We're going to sing this song of response. And I want to encourage you, if you would like to just meet with prayer afterwards, um, we'll just meet up here in front. We're just going to have a prayer time after our worship service today. If you want myself and Augie and the elders to just pray with you, would you just meet up front after the worship service this morning? So we can just pray. Because the reality is, sometimes the road is closed. But God is not closed to our prayers. Let's stand as we sing this song.
is ever faithful he's never changing and so let's leave the day with that these words in our mind lord our god is ever faithful never changing through the ages from this Time up here.